You're listening to the Back Home Network, presented by Homefield Apparel. So what the games, physical basketball I was at the game. You were there. You, you were there. 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 You were Well, we're here. I'm Bob Boats. Welcome to X's and Joe's, a podcast dedicated to decoding the winning formula in college basketball. And I'm Mike Weemouth. Welcome you to episode five, Rivalries. What are they? How do they impact us? And why do we love to hate them? Recorded on the evening of February 14th, 2024. So, Bob, two weekends ago, we were together in Bloomington at last. We were back at it, Um, you know, going, you know, basically acting like we were undergraduates again, although we were asleep a lot sooner than usual. Yeah. Um, you know, the, 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 the 4am conversations just, well, we do this now. So it's kind of the same thing, right? Yeah, basically. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, but you know, walked out, hoofed it back from assembly hall to, uh, the assembly call guys over at upstairs pub took us about mm-hmm. a half hour. That was lovely. Yeah. Good exercise. And they didn't, we didn't need a crash cart by the time we got to, yeah. uh, upstairs pub. Spent 25 minutes talking about how IU could have or couldn't have stopped Ace Baldwin. Yeah, exactly. You know. <laughs> it was a good scouting report, you know, all the way from McNutt, yeah. you know, past the, the Union Building. So, yeah. Yeah. It was, by, it was the, lovely. By, by the time we hit Kirkwood, we're like, okay, there's the upstairs and where'd La Bamba go? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the, the laundry list of places that we used to, uh, to hang out at who are, that are no longer there is uh, rather depressing, but there are still a lot of fun things. And uh, some of our favorite places are still standing luckily. And some new places too. Fat Dan's was lovely as you know, I mean, awesome. that was your, that was your first time there. I know that mm-hmm. that was the first restaurant I took my kid to, you know, so we're, we're big fans, but I will say, um, uh, you, know, you just go to these places, and you know what was great about the meetup was we got to meet all these really cool people that you know listen to the shows and are part of yeah. this overall community through the Back Home Network, yeah. um, and just really got a chance to kind of get to know them a little better and just um, get you know kind of listen to what they were thinking and kind of how they see things are going, and get to hear their stories and and also just again make new friends, which yeah. uh, is kind of the whole point of going to Bloomington, right? Exactly. Yeah, it was uh, it was great meeting you know the fans and also the, the back home network team. Um, yeah. Jared, Andy, coach, Ryan, Scott, Galen, Kathy, Jeff. Finally got to meet uh, Tony face to face. Um, <laughs> after all the, uh, the text messages we've exchanged over the last you know year or two. So <laughs> that was nice. And meeting the spouses was also great. That, so that was, yeah. I don't know about you. I, I sometimes get worried that, you know, you, <sighs> Yeah, that one thing in common with people online, and then yeah. you meet them in real life, and you have nothing to talk about because you have zero in common outside <laughs> of that one thing. But luckily, that wasn't true with the uh, the back home network folks. Um, everyone had a good sense of humor. They were fun to chat with about all things, you know, that did not include basketball. So that was great. Yeah, genuinely great people. And again, I was surprised. I think we both remarked these people are tall. You know, compared to <laughs> that, yeah, the, the camera angles are definitely yeah. uh, uh, interesting on um, assembly call and crimson cast. I will say that. Uh, all, all I know at the end of the day is if you know, this were Hoosiers and that was the team, I'm Ollie. Yeah, exactly. I'm, I I <laughs> went in thinking I was a wing forward or a three, but I was definitely more of a two in the, in that group. So didn't didn't we make you play five in our in our hyper basketball? I, I think we had to. Yeah, I think that was yeah. I was forced into it was AJ were... Moye uh, playing the four kind of thing. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, w- I will say um, among all the things that the great highlights of the weekend, uh, Galen Clavio holding court is much watch viewing. It's uh, I would pay hard cash to watch Galen stem wine on a variety of topics. <laughs> <laughs> agreed, agreed. <laughs> he's like he was definitely the he was like the the Demosthenes of uh, the Kirkwood bar scene that night. No. So uh, I, and I would say that you finally put to rest something for Galen, which is, uh, you know, where, where the whereabouts of one Lionel P twinkles, which I know he was very, con- <laughs> you know, which came up and we're like, 
Exactly. You know, you, there's a legacy 25 years later. It's a beautiful thing. Exactly. You know, you, you run a joke ticket on for student, trying to destroy student government, and, you know, a quarter century later, people are still talking about it. So that's <laughs> lovely. Touché. Yeah. True point. Yeah. So speaking of Galen, we talk about the bison, and we talk about the bison, mm-hmm. we have to talk about something home field. Our sponsor of the Back Home Network, all of our all of our great shows here, did right before the IU Purdue game. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was perfect timing. They had a drop of both Purdue and IU materials. Um, 80s and 90s apparel galore, basically. Um, it was definitely Gene, Katie, Bob Knight era stuff. Um, I actually saw, I don't know if you saw on X, uh, Calbert Cheney posed with the new 1993 Big Ten IU Championship shirt that uh, Homefield released, and that was that was definitely a nice connection to the uh, to the rollout for the uh, for the stuff. So it was great. I saw it. I saw it as I was scrolling through, going, and I was like, "Oh, I, that I got to get that that mm-hmm. because that you know, that was that was the that was my senior year of high school, you know, and so right. that was what kind of drove me, you know, one of those." You know, just just that, and then my wife is sitting here. Ten minutes later, she's scrolling through, going, "I think you want that, don't you?" I go, "Yeah." <laughs> We're thinking, you know, birthdays coming up, Easter's coming up, you yeah. know, Arbor Day's coming up. Doesn't matter what the holiday. Let's, yeah, let's <laughs> yeah. look at that. Yeah, and um, you know, again, it's just just really a cool piece there, as well as other, you know, other ones, mm-hmm. other wonderful memory type pieces from like you know, the one with the seventy six team, mm-hmm. one with uh, Assembly Hall. Um, and yeah, also one, a, quarter the, zip, a quarter zip with a bison on it too, which looks really yeah. cool. I love. I was impressed zips. with the hyper. The, they have the yeah. hyper shirt that shows the level of specificity that uh, uh, Home Field has in terms of the merchandise that they're uh, they're putting out. So that was definitely cool. That is. I, I I especially appreciate that they have IU gear in black for you know those of us grads who don't exactly look too cool in the crimson stuff, and. Yeah, <laughs> I think I think we both uh, remember. I if there's a picture of me wearing red somewhere out there, I think uh, that would be like a scavenger hunt um, <laughs> item since, for for people. Since 1995, I don't think I've ever seen you wear red. Exactly. I mean, that's been we're going probably, on 30 years, brother. I would 30 have to, years. I would probably have to lose a bet. I think for someone to uh, to see me in red. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 So home field. Great stuff, and I definitely recommend it. I've already recommended it to not just IU fans, but I did uh, tell some of my Purdue pals about uh, the latest drop. So it's the perfect gift for any serious college basketball fan any time of the year. Be sure to check out all the great retro wear they have to offer at homefieldapparel.com. So, so Mike, episode, episode five, one of our favorite topics here, and, and I know one that we talk about a lot and um, – one that I know is a, a special passion for you and what we're going to kick off with is the uh, idea of fan psychology and this sort of almost one, two, three, four, what are we fighting for <laughs> approach in the minds of us as we're looking at this and seething or celebrating depending on the situation. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, I think this this is going to be a fun topic and segment because, like I said, it does allow me to jump into my favorite sports side hustles, which is... Uh, the psychology of fans. I, I probably could do a three-hour lecture on this, but we're going to be generous and really boil it down to a Cliff Notes version uh, just for this conversation. So, simply put, um, rivalries. <laughs> Why do they exist? So, um, rivalries exist because of human psychology. Uh, we can tell us psychological because we react to rivalries on emotional terms, not rational ones. I think everyone kind of understands that. Think of all the ways we allow our emotions to get tangled up with our rival schools. Like think of why do fans nervously check their phone to see the score of their rivals games, even when their own teams have the night off or why did that crazy Alabama fan poison the trees at Toomer's corner in Auburn after that, you know, Lost to uh, the Tigers in the uh, in the Iron Bowl, or why do uh, basketball fans have that sense of relief when their rival school finally exits the NCAA tournament? Like, ah, now I can finally enjoy the dance now that so and so school has finally, you know, <laughs> is no longer tor- tormenting my bracket. 
So the, the idea of all this is that um, rivalries can be explained in two basic concepts of uh, social psychology. It's group identity and social comparison. These are concepts most people may remember from, let's say, your Psych 101 class in high school or college. And they do play a huge role in how fans behave within these rivalries. And during this, you know, we'll, after the show, we'll drop some of the psych research materials in the show notes if people really want to uh, dig through the topic themselves. But for now, we'll just explain briefly how rivalries work inside the brains of fans. So at the beginning of people's uh, sports affiliation, sports fandom typically starts in childhood, usually with your parents' favorite team. And you're slowly indoctrinated into that fan base, roughly the same way someone might join a religious order. So as you grow into that group, you learn all the rituals of the team, the chants, the fight song, the history, traditions. You'll start wearing the team colors like there's some kind of required uniform. These activities begin to cement your sense of identity with the team, not just in how you view yourself, but how others start to view you. Um, just think of that, Bob, like, do you remember roughly how old you were when you started, like, really identifying as a IU fan or a Reds fan? Reds fan, I was really, really little. Like, I remember the late 70s teams. I remember being in tears at four when they lost to the Pittsburgh Pirates oh, wow. in the NLCS. Around the same time, that was the same year when, you know, my parents were Indiana State grads. So, mm -hmm. but I took by about five or six, I realized that Indiana and Indiana State were two different places. Okay. So at that point, I began to start gravitating more to the cream and crimson. We drive by and it's like, whoa, this is some, like you go to Dunmeadow, uh, mm -hmm. you go to the Union and you're like, man, I feel like I'm, you know, I feel like I'm in, in something big. Yeah. And I remember that time. And yeah, so about about five or six for me was really when everything kind of solidified. Okay. No, that makes sense. And that kind of tracks. I mean, generally, the research says that by the time you're eight, your fandom becomes generally self-sustaining, meaning that you don't need outsiders pushing you um, into the fan group. You'll, you'll be plenty motivated basically to carry on yourself as a fan at around that age window. So you hear a lot, I mean, especially from people I know who are not sports fans, they'll commonly ask me, why is that the case? Like, why do people get so motivated to join teams when those teams' failures lead to so many ruined weekends and, and frankly, day drinking? And the main reason is psychologically, people are highly motivated to choose uh, groups um, that give them a sense of belonging. And a sense of belonging is a critical need of uh, emotional well-being for all humans. So belonging to a team lowers your sense of alienation and isolation and has a host of other like positive benefits to your mental health up to a point. And we can probably talk about that later. <laughs> um, so over time, as you experience wins and losses together within the fan group, your sense of emotional investment in that team rises. And at, I guess, as they say in business school, your, your sunk cost begins to deepen and your identity begins to permanently fuse with the team. So the team's success and failure becomes, by, expect, by extension, your own success and failure. Your neighbors may start to even identify you first as, let's say, a Michigan fan or an Ohio State fan, even above your occupation, religion and other critical life categories. And you'll even begin to use the language as that seems to assume that your own participation on the team is like a real thing. Like you'll hear people say, not that Michigan won, but we won. And so that, um, so that emotional investment, as it deepens with the team, um, you'll start to form what the academics would call in-groups as well as out-groups. Um, which is essentially your rivals. At the same time, the people in those outgroups, in those uh, rival schools, they'll be going through the exact same kind of uh, fan socialization that you're going through with your own team. And so as over time, you know, the, the more 
the more your, identi your identity is linked to sports teams, the more strongly you're willing to defend your squad and even antagonize fans uh, from the rival teams. There's even something called um, disinhibition, which happens when your loyalty to the group is so strong that you are willing to basically engage in antisocial behavior and up to including violent acts. So I've, I've been around third and fourth graders enough over the years to know that sometimes that that <laughs> sports rivalry conversations when you're three, when you're, when you're nine, 10, eight, nine, 10 and 11 can get pretty heated. Oh yeah. You know, and, and at that point, you know, it's like, before you know it, you're, you're basically comparing each other's mother's lack of attributes, <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah. The, uh, yeah, the, the, the quality of the, uh, the rhetoric does not improve over time. So. It, 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 well, we, we, we've been around enough to know that's true. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. No, I, I, when I think of the examples, I always think of like, uh, like English soccer fans or. The, or perhaps the fans of the NFL franchise that just happens to be in my current city of residence. So <laughs> they, they have a reputation. Just a little bit, yeah. <laughs> Santa Claus and batteries just yep. seem to go hand in hand, and, and not for putting them into toys. <laughs> yeah, and, and, a, and a lock up literally within the stadium for the police just to make it easier on the police. So. <laughs> and an arraignment court. They put an arraignment court down there. I mean, it's, exactly. just, it's, a, it's a thing. It's a yep. thing. I know, I know people have been to Eagles Court. Yep, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I guess like, you know, if, and you and I are both political people, you know, and mm -hmm. we we typically hear this term or this concept explained as tribalism by the social scientists. And typically it is a political term, especially for identity politics, but it is its application to sports is, you know, really just as strong. And um, so when you're fully invested as a fan, um, you'll enter basically the second stage of this process, which is social comparison. And what, what happens during social comparison simply is that, you know, we human beings love to compare ourselves to others. Um, in some ways, we're kind of addicted to comparison. Um, there's a lot of research on this concept it's called social comparison theory, which basically means people value their own personal and self-worth by assessing how they compare to others. So it's not so much what you have, but how much more or less you have relative to the people around you. So you can see how this, you know, develops within teams. Like if, if your identity is linked to your team's success, your sense of self-worth can rise and fall depending upon your team's win-loss record. But your relative sense of value is also dependent on what your rival school is doing at the same time. And again, this is not, you know, explicitly a sports specific phenomenon like you think about how people feel when a a friend gets a big promotion a huge salary bump and suddenly they're moving into a larger house in a larger in a nicer neighborhood or you know a classmate gets a part of a big play that maybe you wanted to, um or you tried out for or and there's research on this like you know rates of depression spike for people who are the last in their social group to uh to get engaged or married and so most commonly people will think of these uh, in other terms like, you know, keeping up with the Jones Joneses or, uh, or FOMO, fear of missing out. It's all basically kind of wraps under the same umbrella of social comparison. Well, and, and oftentimes, I mean, part of this also is this also fear that like I'm a nostalgic fan. I think you are too. Oh yeah. We grew, we grew up in a time where, I call it the breaking away years at IU, mm -hmm. um, where you had IU basketball winning a national title roughly every five, six years. Martha, you know, and, and the broadcast, I mean, every game was on TV and the world stopped. Yeah. When that, when that TV show, when, 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 when Martha the Mop Lady hit the screen, mm -hmm. we still do it before every game. I put my son in front of the TV. Here's Martha the Mop Lady. The world will stop for two hours as IU plays basketball. That was a good maybe addition. Three, yeah. Maybe three hours, maybe three hours before the game so we can go to bed. But it's one of those things where I'm going through the rituals with my kid yeah. because there are no existing episodes of Cowboy Bob, you know, left. And, <laughs> and that's, and if you grew up in this area, you know who Cowboy Bob was. 
your mom took you to see Cowboy Bob, and now you understand why mom took you to see Cowboy Bob. Yeah. But as we're kind of talking about this, there's also that Grey Gardens concept where we're afraid that we're, you know, where we may, we don't want to be, and if you've ever seen the movie or, right. I know, Mike, you talk about the, the Magnificent Ambersons is another one where it's like yeah. the, the fam, a, a very well-to-do family, priorly well-to-do, they have this house that has raccoons living in it, they're in mm-hmm. this mansion. They're eating chicken out of a pot next to the bed, and these two women, mo- mother and daughter, who are actually an aunt and cousin of Jackie Kennedy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's Jackie yeah. Kennedy Onassis. Yeah. And Lee, uh, th- these two are, you know, just, and they, and you go through about an hour and a half of them just living this weird sort of life where we're socialites. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> but, but our hair, uh, but we're living in like, destitute poverty it's like or, or gilded squalor you know another way gilded squalor is a great way to look at it so yeah. we don't want to be a gray garden you know because then we look at our lives and like oh, are we still living in this mansion with the raccoons living in it yeah i mean are there are there are there feral cats eating and you know eating eating our garbage yeah um it's really one of those things i think that pulls at our heartstrings a little bit when we see something that we love so much yeah well you're or, right it brings us Brings us great happiness when they're successful. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the, the whole thing with rivalries, you know, and just your own team performance, especially, it's like they are prestige fights, if you think about it. Um, if your team's or your rival's team wins games or championships, it changes sort of like the relative position of the team and by extension of the fans relative to the other teams and other fans. So um, as humans, we're always sort of seeking some sense of uh, social prestige, dominance, you know, is another <laughs> another way to look at it. But um, sports is obviously a, a far less um, fraught way of going about establishing, you know, dominance hierarchies than other ways. But uh, certainly th- there are some uh, side effects of that, <laughs> when, mm-hmm. especially in the parking lot after the game, when, uh, when the Eagles and the Giants uh, have to leave the stadium at the same time. Or when we're sitting in row 17 of ross Aid Stadium, surrounded by Purdue fans and one of our... Dear friends. One of, dear friends... <laughs> Decides now is the time for us to have a heated conversation exactly. and utilize his rapier-like wit and <laughs> lack of it and, and lack of concern over the physical safety of his friends. Exactly, because we're like, look, if I had if I had seven guys, if I had five people to get into a bar fight, these are not the five I'd pick. And Mike, I love you, but you and I are in the same boat with this. We know four other people we'd rather have in that situation. You remember, like five minutes ago, we're talking about disinhibition. That yeah, was an example of that. That was an example. They were, yeah, I've seen plenty of those. Yeah, exactly. So so we, we talk about the bucket, and we talk about Indiana-Purdue. And so when we talk about real quick, you know, kind of quickly talking about types of rivalries between programs and between, um, you know, just, and even individuals. Um, you have, you, I, I kind of looked at, when we were looking at this, you know, like, like, break these down a little bit. And so we have, what we call the, you know, what we, what we are going to call traditional rivalries. They're historic and are geographic. Um, a good example would be Army Navy, which is a historical rivalry dating back to the mm-hmm. beginning of the country and the beginning of the military service academies. Yeah. The rivalry goes, you know, now we go to war, they're on the same team, but they still have this sort of back and forth with each other to say, it's a way, almost like with that rivalry within the service academy rivalries, it's steel sharpening steel. Yeah. Um, you know, I think when you look at Ohio State, Michigan, or um, that's another one that's a traditional rivalry. It's kind of unique because they're from two different states. But when you think that those states almost fought a war over the city of Toledo, and by war they put their militias out on the, you know, basically they they rose a militia and the other one, and then they had a whole thing, and then basically Ohio gets Toledo, and I think Michigan got something else out of the deal. Yeah. But back in, in the territorial days. Ohio and Michigan have had this rivalry, so their two flagship institutions go at it, which mm-hmm. then makes Michigan State upset because they're like, well, we're, we're also a flagship institution. Yeah. And so then Michigan State and Michigan have a rivalry as well. So these these geographic rivalries, IU-Purdue, IU definitely fits that bill, yeah. where these are the two largest institutions in the state. They are two w- with deep, rich histories. When it came down to we have a football team, well, we have to play Purdue. They're mm-hmm. just they're a couple hours, you know, they're they're about they're a half day's train ride from Bloomington or West Lafayette. And we'll 
we're going to do this and uh, we're going to we're going to we're going to kind of define ourselves by the fact that we're going against each other and when you grow up it's always been IU and Purdue as a rivalry same thing with University of Kentucky for Indiana same thing for Notre Dame with Purdue because of the proximity and because of the prestige of those institutions now it kind of one's public one's private uh, the other one are two different states but that also kind of just uh, pushes us into a traditional sort of sort sort of sort of relationship, and it's never going to go away. Um, you have, I think, there are times where and, and programs we think we, we'll talk about times when they have personal rivalries, and I think the one that always comes to mind, you know, for IU fans was back in the late '80s when Lou Henson and Bob Knight were getting into it in press conferences, and really it's more yeah. Lou Henson calling him a classic bully. Yeah, at that point, he may be one, but he's ours. And yeah. no, and, and, <laughs> and watching Nick Anderson, you still, and you still hear the Illinois fan mm-hmm. talk about Nick Anderson. I mean, every time Stephen Bardo sits at half court and he looks at that spot, it's like the greatest accomplishment of, of his life, even though he didn't do it, yeah. you know, Nick and, Anderson and the, hitting and, that shot. Yeah. And the, and the Bardo family, I do believe, uh, came out on the floor and celebrated, not just, um, Steven. So. <laughs> and, and so there's, there, there's history there, obviously, because of this, the, the brother playing at IU, too. So. Right. True. Yeah. All that. Yeah. And so that personal thing. And now, granted, the rivalry for, for I think, from IU's perspective is nothing. And I think, you know, Mike, you, you've got an idea that, you know, we probably need a matchmaking service for Illinois. Yeah. No. Yeah. I've. Um, <laughs> I, I've I had this uh, sort of whis- not so uh, quiet whisper campaign to try to play um, matchmaker between Illinois and uh, and Maryland since they are the uh, I guess they're, they're the two teams in the conference that don't really have strong rivals obviously and for years you know they've been they've been buggering different fan bases within the conference trying to, you know, earnestly start up some kind of new rivalry. So, so yeah, since we don't want to, you know, we don't want any spinsters, you know, uh, flying around alone amongst our conference family, I thought maybe, why don't we just engage in a bit of, bit of matchmaking and see if we can forge some kind of arranged sports marriage of sorts between I think Maryland they're the, they're the, and, and Illinois. They're the last two in the friends group. At this point, they're like, we're in our mid-30s. Uh, yeah. We've got nothing else going on. We kind of like to be around each other. All right, we should just do this because the rest of them are doing it. And, yeah. you know, we'll just vacation together, basically. Yeah, I, I think it, it, that it'll, works. It'll, yeah, and it'll, it also saves some, uh, <laughs> some of the anxiety of the other fan bases in um, the conference getting uh, – constantly badgered <laughs> by just leave us alone go exactly. go off and do your thing and so yeah that, yeah, that we, we yeah. would uh yeah it would be fun we, we could be like the the czarist yentas of the the <laughs> basketball prairies if we could actually get them you know hooked get up them together. together exactly Let's, yeah and we'll buy them a nice mixer they'll, they'll exactly. love it <laughs> yeah, exactly um so, so you got this you, this overt conflict between coaches, and I mean, another one. I mean, you, you and I both we were in college when this happened. When Calip when, when Calipari's you have in a press conference, and there's John Cheney from Temple right down the road from you. Yeah, that, and basically where, my, thre- my other school, <laughs> your other school. Yeah, yeah. he threatened he threatened to phys- threatened to kill him. Did he? Yeah. He actually threatened to kill the man. Mm-hmm. And so that thing fires up quick. Or players sometimes you see rivalries between individual players where, like the Bird Magic is probably the best example of that. Sure. Where, you know, it's just, it starts in college and it carries on to the pros and they just kind of fell into two franchises that traditionally couldn't stand each other yeah. and kind of re, you know, took, put an extra edge on a traditional rivalry. Yeah. Perfect um, opposites and opposites yeah. part of the country too. Yeah. And it wasn't like, you know, Kobe and Paul Pierce did it. You know, you didn't have that 30 years later with those two, but yeah. you definitely had it with bird and magic. Um, mm-hmm. So it fires up your fan base, but extinguishes with turnover as people leave. It's like, yeah, we there was a thing once, but we're kind of over it. The other thing with some personal rivalries is that you get a situation like IU and Duke had for a while, where you had Bob Knight and Mike Shashevsky, where it's the, you know, the you know the the master and the and the apprentice, mm-hmm. that sort of power dynamic. I think Dean Smith had that at times with some of his with with um, especially with Roy Williams at times where. Yeah. You know, and it just kind of got programs more fired up. It was a great narrative for the media to kind of highlight this sort of relationship between them. And yeah, and, that, and so that kind of fits into more, it's not always a, a visceral rivalry. It's sometimes it's actually a rivalry where you're kind of steel sharpened steel or yeah. it's a great story 
to go yeah. into. And it's great for the great for ratings, obviously. Incre- incredibly good for ratings. And yeah, you look at look at during the regular season, especially like in college football and college basketball. Consistently, the most watched, most viewed games will typically be like Ohio State, Michigan, or Duke, Carolina, IU, Purdue. It's it's um, it's very rare that it's not a rivalry game. Is the uh, you know the the top viewed game um, during the regular season. And so. Yeah, exactly. If you're going to tune into one game, this is the one you're going to watch. Or if you're going to go to a game, this is the one you're going to go to. Because sometimes you actually go with your neighbors, yeah. you know, that sort of thing. I mean, sometimes you will see people who will truck up together, Purdue and IU fans, and just yell at each other, and then they'll barbecue, and then they yeah. go home. Yeah. So the the other, you know, but there's also, I think, more situational rivalries that we see. You know, I think of UCLA back in the 60s with Houston and Notre Dame, mm-hmm. and that it was almost like, circumstance you know those circumstances were a little different than what we see like let's say with duke and michigan in the 90s where they're both playing a version of king of the mountain and so they create a series iu kansas does this frequently we've rekindled that situational rivalry that goes back to 1940 with fog allen and branch mccracken you know where every you know every few years you know the programs feel like we can start playing each other again we feel comfortable playing each other again we feel like we get competitive with each other, so let's give let's give the fans a great game because we're both we're we're both traditional blue blood programs, but it can glide dormant for 10, 15 years. Yeah. Um. Sometimes it is that style and image of two programs where you look at a, you know, you you, you look and you go back to that uh, Duke versus Michigan in the nineties where it was a Fab Five versus guys like, like Christian early, Leitner. yeah the Leitner and Hurley teams yeah. Or the other one, which actually weirdly bled over into Indiana in 2002 when Duke and Kentucky, after the Mashburn, after oh, yeah. Leitner. Again, a personal rivalry, but it becomes almost situational because there's a style and an image of these two programs who are going at each other. And it was so weird that 10 years after the stomp, you know, Kentucky fans are in IU gear cheering for IU, or in, in Kentucky Rup- gear, yeah. in Rupp Arena, in Rupp cheering Rupp Arena. for IU to beat duke yeah never thought i'd see that and so as time goes on and you start seeing you know these frequent matchups or mm-hmm. conference realignments um you start seeing these these situational rivalries pop up with the hope that maybe they they elevate to a traditional like i was watching florida atlantic play uab mm-hmm. at uab and i guess it's been fairly hot and contested florida atlantic ended up losing the game i think in either overtime or double overtime and the and the and the announcer for ESPN is hyping this going, this is a this is they're hoping this is, becomes a rivalry game between these two teams. I'm like, okay. We're <laughs> okay. <laughs> Did uh, no, it's just but it's also because where the two programs sit in the American yeah. conference, they play each other frequently. Mm-hmm. And with all the realignments, it's like it's time and also Florida Atlantic has surged under, you know, yeah, under, under Dusty May. Dusty May, yeah. The media is going to be really excited and they really and they're going to want to you know have something more to promote and to try to push more the casual fan if they're flipping through channels going I don't want to watch championship log splitting this looks interesting it's a rivalry game it's it's yeah. University of Alabama Birmingham versus Florida Atlantic yeah. obviously one of the one of the high ticket a top ticket item yeah so exactly yeah no that's yeah I mean it's interesting so, yeah you think about um yeah there's like in in looking at the psych- psychological angle and just looking at the typology of it is that there's so many angles at which you could find yourself in opposition to like another fan group. I mean, I, I kind of like how you showed. Yeah. I mean, ge- geographical is like the most obvious. I mean, mm-hmm. you're just kind of living under the same roof and you're just going to be like, you know, kind of at each other's throats, like, you know, young siblings, but you're right. I mean, there, there, there are so many different types that can like pop up that don't, don't seem traditional and kind of come and go. So I, yeah, I think the, uh, the ones we're most used to understanding are like, again, like Alabama, Auburn, Indiana, Purdue, um, Duke UNC, Duke UNC. But yeah, you're right. There are those ones that are like kind of geographically untangled. So it's like Notre Dame USC, um, is like one I always love to, to watch. So historic. And, and they've been doing this since the thirties and I don't yeah. know. And I mean, if somebody knows the story without, you know, if you know it, let us know because it's, 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 I mean, I'm sure I could Google it, but interesting to hear from some of you all about that. Like yeah, exactly. how did that one happen? Other than, you know, yeah. Other than just the fact that they both, you know, figured they could take a trip someplace. 
Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's interesting. Like I, the, um, yeah, the, the, and how rivalries play, just think about like uh, the, the geographical um, angle, like living in Indiana and growing up here, I, I kind of thought I had some sense of like how rivalries operated. Um, and being an Indiana fan, obviously, I kind of looked it through my own lens of what I thought, you know, a rivalry was, how it operated, let's say, year to year. I guess I didn't really understand like how intense, like the feeling of that sports anxiety I discussed uh, was until I moved here to Philly, like in the early 2000s. Um, and and the, the time before the Philadelphia Eagles won the Super Bowl. Um, and in that time, it was almost like the perfect, um, like lab experiment for like what we're talking about here, this, this concept of uh, social comparison and, and status envy. I'd go to Chickies and Pete's, like the popular sports bar in Philly to watch an Eagles game. And the broadcast would often invariably flash up that graphic about the NFC East and their dominance in the playoffs. And they would show like New York, Washington and Dallas. And all their Super Bowls are listed. And then sitting sad and alone down below all of them at the bottom of the list with a zero next to them is Philadelphia. And I would peek around the bar and you would see Eagles fans like physically wincing at the mere sight of that graphic. It was like they were all getting punched in the groin collectively through the television screen by that graphic. And so it's... um, it's interesting if you're from like one area and you move to another and you start to see a rivalry through a completely different lens maybe than the ones you're used to and understand like, oh, okay, that's how they react to it when they're sort of like at this position of the, the rivalry versus this. Um, the Yeah, just hearing uh, Cowboys and Giants fans, like how they talk to <laughs> Eagles fans. It's hilarious. It's like something you would hear like in any college basketball rivalry. Um, this is their Super Bowl. We live rent free in their heads. You know, they're the little brother. We're the big brother. I mean, it's all the stuff you would hear in college football and college basketball, and it plays the same way. But I guess I had never seen it from the standpoint of sort of like the little guy, I guess, in the in the relationship. And and yeah, it's it's not even just like how they're angry at the other team. They're oftentimes angry at third parties, like the media. Like, if, if you want to experience a true barroom beatdown, just go into any Philly sports bar and repeat the phrase, Dallas Cowboys, America's team. And I guarantee you in about three minutes, you're going to be in the emergency room somewhere in greater downtown Philadelphia. It's not like you don't have the Liberty Bell, like... 10 minutes away. Yeah. <laughs> like, the, yeah. like, the country's literally founded in this and... Dallas. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I get. I, I can see that. Yeah. No. And in, in, but it's but it's interesting. It's like you know when you think about it, like how we debate our rivals. We're essentially playing almost like defense attorney for our squads. You know, we're highlighting all the best arguments for our team. We're ignoring, you know, the the most inconvenient information against our own argument for our team. So it, it's why I've always theorized that if you reverse the roles of any fan base and their team history, then the rhetoric that the fan base uses will flip as well. I mean, if you think about like Indiana and Purdue, and I always tell IU and Purdue fans this, if you took every event from the two schools' histories and flipped them around, you took every single coach and player and every win and loss and switched them between Indiana and Purdue, like Piggy Lambert and um, Gene Cady now coached at IU, um, Mm -hmm. Branch McCracken and Bob Knight now coached at Purdue, what, how would the fan bases change and react to that? Well, IU fans would do what Purdue fans do now. They would brag about their head-to-head uh, record advantage or a lead in conference titles. And Purdue fans, what would they do? Well, they do what IU fans do now. They would talk about five banners and, and always being listed as a top-end historical program. Well, and, and you see that with Packers. I mean, I'll just go, you know, my favorite teams are the Bears. And you see that with Packers and Bears fans. Like mm-hmm. right now, the Bears are in a historically lousy run with the Packers, and again, it's a rent free in your head. Aaron, you know, there we just sold the team. You know, Aaron Rodgers owns, and now he's passed it on to, you know, and and you and you and you listen, but then you go back to the '80s when I remember first getting coming aware, and the Packers were terrible, 
And it was like, yeah, we just beat them again 38 to 10 on Monday night. It's their Super Bowl. We just humiliated them again. You know, Vince Lombardi is not coming through that door. We, we've we got Bart Starr fired from the job. I mean, all sorts of good stuff where we're yeah. just kind of going, Ditka, our Hall of Famer is better than your Hall of Famer. And yeah. you're like 10, 11, 12 years old going, yeah, we got these guys for perpetuity. Brett Favre shows up, whole new ball game. But yeah, exactly. it's, well, it's, it's a change. Yeah, And it, no. you're right. There, there's that, that sort of polar where it even happens inside these rivalries where you're not as dominant as you used to be or you or you regain your dominance and yeah. then the fan bases do that yeah. again. Well, the be- the best thing if you think about it is that um you see it within individuals. Like I, I always think the best example is like uh Boston fans. Yeah. Like during baseball season. You think like Boston has like each all four of their rivalries um are some of the most prominent in sports, you know, it's like the Canadians, Bruins, um, Celtics, Lakers, uh, Red Sox, Yankees, um, and uh, Patriots versus, well, everyone who's not Everybody. a Patriots fan. Yeah. Um, during baseball, Red Sox fans, they put on their Luke Skywalker helmet and say, you know, we're the little guy. We're attacking the Death Star. The Death Star is the Yankees. They're the bad guys. They're arrogant. They cheat. Um, their championships don't mean that much. And then they bought him. They bought yeah, him. They, they bought, bought their all titles. Those exactly. Starting with Babe Ruth, they bought him and they bought everybody it's else. Stolen from us. Exactly. Now he was our guy. So those same people, just weeks later, after the season is over, <laughs> baseball, they will take off their Luke Skywalker helmet and happily and knowingly put on the Darth Vader helmet for the Patriots season. Look at the rings. Uh, they hate us because they ain't us. They're just jealous of, you know, we don't cheat. They're just jealous of, uh, you know, our success. The exact same fans will switch their arguments in support of their team based upon what is circumstantially advantageous for those fans and for that team. And it can be noted the Boston, the Vader helmet also has on a Celtics logo with a little leprechaun and a B for the Bruins. Yeah, that that's that that it up that that, that actually be, even before the Patriots, the Patriots were lousy. They still had that where it's like the Red Sox fan swaps over to. Yeah, that psychology. It's amazing. It's amazing. And yeah. so as we kind of go through this, let's let's talk about what does it really mean? You know, because all of this is kind of setting up what the real kind of thing is, which is at some point this does impact how fans see their program, but also what they demand from their programs, as well as how programs actually at times will adjust what they're doing because the rivalry has gotten out of control. So we'll do that after the break here on X's and Joe's. Welcome back to X's and Joe's. I'm Mike Weemouth, joined by Coach Bob Motes. Bob, um... Now we talked about the psych angle of rivalries. Maybe let's spend some time on some of the more, I guess, practical matters. Like, what do you do when your rival's success starts driving your team and your fan base absolutely crazy? It's a really a great question because I think the first thing you, you it, it's not like a stage is a grief thing almost, <laughs> where the awareness. I think the awareness that something is amiss, that you're not as competitive. And I mean, you can take this back to, I remember, you know, back, you know, even back in the going back in the, you know, when it was one thing when IU would lose um, at a Maui Invitational, it was something else where they get run off the floor. In fact, we started this show talking about IU getting run off the floor in, in Louisville, Kentucky. And all of a sudden you start thinking, well, maybe we need to do things differently. And then... Even before message board culture, which I think, and the internet, which I think has pushed that a little bit, um, you started hearing, well, is is our guy up to the job, mm-hmm. mainly the head coach? Do we have the right type of players? Are we running the right type of offensive and defensive schemes? Um, why, you know, we don't we don't necessarily want to be them, but we got to find something that beats them. And so at this mm-hmm. point, it becomes more and more of a driving force. Whereas, you know, like Lee Corso once famously said, look, I have two, I have two jobs. I got to beat Purdue and I got to beat Kentucky. If I do that, I save my job. Yeah. 
Yeah. You know, and when the, when that goes away, and you started noticing this over the years with IU coaches, or and and this is true in rivalries as well, or in the case of let's say um, a Coop, John Cooper, Cooper at Ohio yeah. State, yeah. it and we talk about chip stacks a lot, and we're going to continue to talk about them. Like this is almost like a super double, like double jeopardy for you. Like the like the ante when you play a rival goes up two, three, four times of your usual chips being shoved in. Yeah. And that minimum bet goes up too. And the more you don't replenish from those rivalry wins, the more vulnerable that coach becomes. Absolutely. We we, we found that in the research that you know that we've done on um on chip stacks is that you know they've they've done studies in different sports and then show that that the one of the most um, significant ver- predictable variables in determining whether a coach would be retained or fired was their performance against rivals and relative to rivals. And again, it kind of gets back to you know what we talked about in segment one about that relativity thing. Again, it's the social comparison of fans sensing that, oh man, we're falling behind. And when the team falls behind, I fall behind against my neighbors, friends that are kind of like teasing me on, on, um, on message boards and, uh, you know, text messaging. So, um, so yeah, that, that all fits. It all kind of like ties together in a, a strange sort of way. And, and I think from a fan, you know, when you look at the fan perspective and, you know, fans matter in that they're buying the shirts, they're donate, you know, in, in the, you know, they're buying tickets they're tuning into the games. Um, the engagement factor, I think, goes up significantly when they're feeling better about their programs. Totally. And the toxic and, and the toxicity of everything goes up when they're not. And so when you start noticing, like after a big a bad loss to Purdue, I mean, I remember sitting in Knicks, and we'll talk about Purdue specifically later. But I remember sitting in Knicks after the '97 of Purdue loss, where you know Austin hit it in overtime. And there's John Wall, the president of the board of trustees, and he just walks up. He's walking back to have dinner. I'm sitting there with, uh, I think, you know, Doug and some other guys, and it were, you know, he just goes, "Boy, that was a rough one." And I go, "Yeah, yeah that was a rough one." And I mean, and that was, you know, again, someone who, you know, again carries himself with a lot of dignity and class. But you also saw at the same time at the end of that game, you had Purdue, Brad Miller and Brian Carton. Our fan base is just, just whipping into them, yeah, because as you said, you know, is that D, you know, the um, you know, um, you're no longer going to be socially acceptable. Yeah, exactly. And if yeah. you're in a mob, which is like the, which is like a student section, and nobody mm-hmm. knows who the heck you are, and everyone's yeah. doing the same thing, jump right on in. Oh yeah, mob me- mob mentality mob it reduces mentality. people's um, yeah inhibitions. Yeah, and yeah, I mean now now you're pushing over our ushers. We got a problem. Yeah. You know, we we got we got to fight the battle somehow as to yeah. why we're still. Re- not even relevant, but why we're still in the right in something. And mm-hmm. and I think that that actually drives us as fans to a certain degree that it starts pushing people to start making changes. It's harder to defend your program. It's yeah. harder to, because you can say, yeah, but, but that that's staring you in the face. And the water mm-hmm. cooler battle in a place like in Indiana or with the Ohio State-Michigan rivalry, um, you know, Duke Carolina, like if you saw five straight years where Duke didn't win to Carolina, the question is how many head coaches would Duke go go through? Sure, yeah, and that and that's where the fans the fan the fan conversation becomes all the more problematic. Yeah, and it gets the attention of athletic directors, gets the attention of university presidents. Yeah, and that's what we're talking about, you know, in the in the chip stack conversation, and um, and if you think about, especially in the context of social media. Um, years ago, before you had message boards, before you had things like pigs and inside the hall, there would be animosity. There would be public um, disquiet, let's say. Mm-hmm. But it was a little bit more subdued and, and it had a little bit more, it took more to get the mob going in an environment where you had no social media. And now today, people, People who are thousands of miles away can basically participate in a virtual mob against a coach that they feel is underperforming. And so that just ratchets up all of um, the chips in the stack in terms of, you know, what's at stake. And again, 
rivalries just do drive more chips being pushed in the middle. Um, for both bo- on both ends, you think about um, how many times coaches have basically saved themselves by having poor performance generally, but having reasonably decent performance against their rivals that allow them to at least like skate along for a little bit longer. Mike Davis actually had a very good record against Purdue, and I've always theorized that had he had a poor record against Purdue, that perhaps right. he may have not been pushed out, you know, multiple years ahead of time, but he certainly probably would have been much, much more danger than he did um, towards those last years of his uh, was, tenure. In his five-year tenure, and I remember a specific, because there's a converse to the Mike Davis era because Purdue was definitely down. Yeah. And we'll get, I think, yeah, this is actually a, an integral part of the conversation and a good switch for us because Mike Davis, they, it was something where the Big Ten did something screwy with adding conference games or I, I can't remember. They, they didn't, ex, did they expand the conference at that point? I can't remember. If they they expanded played one. They played one. I remember during the, one of the Davis Hoosier said, Dome. they played one of the Hoosier Dome. Yeah, exactly. And it was like a 74 70 game. Bracey Wright, I think it was his freshman year. It was mm-hmm. Marshall Strickman's freshman year. It was right off the final four run. Yeah. And what was bad about it, from the IU fans' perspective, was they should have won by more. Mm-hmm. How is it that Purdue's down and we're not kicking them? And it seemed like nobody got it. Yeah. And I mean that because I remember having that thought, like going, and I'm in my early mid twenties at this point, and I've been through a lot of you know traumatic Purdue losses. You know, play that, play that card. But it was like you can also. Even you know, even in times where you're being relatively successful, you can still turn on your players. Oh, they just don't understand. And this was again on the heels of Bob Knight. Bob Knight had been fired three years prior. These guys just don't get it. He's going up against Gene Cady. You got to bring your A game because eventually, yeah. when the talent evens out a little bit, and we don't get the if we don't understand this game, and now it's kind of this sort of site, you know, this thing. And these players that we were getting at that point throughout most of Mike Davis's run were not Indiana kids. Yeah. And so that begins to fuel that sort of conversation that we were having also of in you know, well, these local kids would understand the rivalry. And so you Exactly. You can sit in a cigar bar in Lincoln, Nebraska and hear a guy talk about, well, these you know, those walk ons from Nebraska will get it. And these five stars don't understand it. We've had exactly. this conversation black, the, before. Yeah, the black shirts uh, understand and the <laughs> Yeah. 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 They'll get it because they're from here and they'll understand that you got to bring your A game against Oklahoma or, you know, against, you know, you got to bring your A game, you know, and that's, that's that mindset, even though now Nebraska or Iowa now, and, you know, the other big 10, Wisconsin, that you, you're wearing the, you know, you're wearing that pride of Nebraska here. And and so name on the front of the Jersey, not the back and all that. Because oftentimes our rivalry conversations are backwards looking as fans. Yeah. It's not about the future. It's about protecting your past. It's about protecting the nest egg. It's about preventing yourself from getting into a spot where you're living with the raccoons in the attic. Yeah. You know, that's, that's your fear. And, yeah. oh, well, these kids don't get it. And then all of a sudden, then it just kind of, you're taking something away from me. Mm-hmm. And I think with, with, with that, it's, you know, when you're talking about programs and their engagement, when it gets bad to a certain level, and you know, again, we you know bring up like right now, Ryan Day is going through this at Ohio State to a certain degree. The guy's winning at a incredible number and an incredible level, but, but the Michigan thing is mm-hmm. there, yeah, and the program is noticing it, yeah, and they're noticing it in a big way yeah. that you just and and there's there's also just, yeah there's also that bias of uh, the the contrast bias of the priors, right? You think mm-hmm. about the record that Ohio State's had over Michigan in the last you know, decade, almost two decades, where what Michigan won like twice uh, yeah. in like an 18, what, 19 year period. And all of a sudden now Michigan is actually has a streak going. So that actually makes it worse. I mean, if, if it were like kind of a back and forth, uh, a right. Woody versus Bo years where they're actually just swapping uh, wins and losses, Probably having a little bit of a streak go bad against you would be not great, but at least manageable. But if you've gone from where Michigan is completely down relative to Ohio mm-hmm. State, and now Ohio's, uh, and now Michigan has vaulted above Ohio State, 
now you really get into uh, just a, almost like a whiplash effect in terms of like status and prestige between you know the schools and also the fans. Well, and and I think yeah, and that's and that prestige, and and now at that point, because when you go through maybe a two three year losing streak, and especially or you go through a four game, you know Archie Miller never beats Purdue, and that's on the list of sins. It's in the top three. Yeah, it's in the top three exactly. that you never beat Purdue. You know, Bob Knight comes and, and, back to the for the yeah, first about time. To say that one, yeah. Lose to Purdue, and I mean, yeah. you know, you had to win that game. This is yeah. the one, and you, and that was the year where Purdue was sitting in top twenty-five in Ken Palm and with a five hundred record, yeah. and you still get beat by double digits. And and at that point, you know, you start hearing boos in Assembly Hall. Mm. It becomes socially acceptable to, even though you were a tournament team, your high, your low light of the season was that, yeah, and. And at that point, then it becomes easier for the program to look at this and say, well, what changes are you making? How are you doing this differently? Where, where, because at this point, this is almost like it's high, it's, it's, it's very superficial to a certain degree because what's the difference ultimately between Purdue and Michigan when you look at conference standings? But our fan base looks at this from a much different perspective. And, yeah. and that's where the program, I think, starts. And this was, again, I think one of the big issues with Gene Cady was um, when they were losing to Mike Davis and Bruce Weber. We talked about this where Weber goes to Illinois with the big shifts and you're losing maybe the guy that you think is going to bring, you know, you, you lost your coach in waiting. So now we got to bring Matt Painter in. Yeah. Um, I think in some respects it's pushed, it's pushed, it's pushed, um, you know, I think it kind of pushed Duke to bring Mike Krzyzewski in to try a, a hot young coach to go up against Dean Smith. Sure. Somebody who was a knight disciple, someone who could figure out how to bring this program in and then really build that rivalry. And then when Krzyzewski finally caught up to Dean and in many respects surpassed him, Dean goes away from some of the recruiting that he was doing with, again, heavy on bigs. Yeah. You didn't really see a, you know, yeah, you saw the Montroses in there, but he wasn't the focal point of the offense like a Brad Dordery was when he was there. Yeah. You get, you know, you start noticing that, you know, now you start seeing the stack houses. Yeah. Now you start seeing, you know, yeah, just NBA, diff- le- yeah, consistent flow of NBA level guards and wings, you know, right. at a higher rate not than before. At a higher rate, and guys that were going to be highlighted on NBA teams, not just really good pieces. Yeah. Fewer Jeff Lebos, more, um, more, um, more Jerry Stackhouse. Well, right. Yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Vince Carter, too, right? I mean, he was yep. on that. Yeah. He, he fits that. He was. So, so it really kind of pushes this whole narrative that, okay, I have to stay on top of this guy because if I don't, and because especially in geographical rivalries, you're oftentimes going after the same dudes. Yeah, you're it's a zero, yeah, it's, it's a zero, a zero sum and game, and that's, and that's Ultimate, a zero yeah, sum the, game. Yeah, the definition of a zero sum game: you get them and they don't. And I mean, we've seen this how many times at IU where uh, you got a really angry Purdue kid. Because because IU said we want you to go to Purdue. <laughs> mm-hmm. Essentially, yeah, yeah. Essentially, I mean, yeah. and so Click that the head coach. I, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and and how does it how does that push you know as a program then as an athletic director as a university president you're now looking at this from a standpoint of now we have real money on the table real skin in the game yeah and we're not gonna you know so yeah there's usually more sins but. Because uh, and they see those chip stacks have evaporated to a certain level. At that point, the buyout becomes worth it because the lat the fir- your first job, Lee says, you got to beat Purdue. You got to beat. You've got to beat Kentucky. Yeah. And and really, oftentimes it just comes down to, you know, because we're the more modern place. We're the place that isn't plodding along with the bigs. Yeah. You know. You look at a prime example because yeah, I think oftentimes you know we you know we look at these schools. Oftentimes they are polar polar opposites from each other. Yeah, sometimes by necessity. It, by necessity, yeah. I think yeah. that's the Purdue IU relationship in many respects. In some ways, but yeah. like, um, like when you look down at Kentucky and Louisville, which is a great rivalry, um, and has been for over off and on over the last 50, 60 years. Denny Crum versus Eddie Sutton versus Joby Hall. Those programs were just 
different. One was a Metro inside driven team, the Doctors of Dunk, whereas yeah. Kentucky's always been about, you know, really at that point it was about shooting. Yeah. So, you know, now you see two contrasting styles. And if you're a Louisville kid, you know, and a Louisville fan, you know, you're, you, you know that, well, our style is better than the Kentucky style. And a lot of times that is a necessity conversation that coaches have to have because of the types of guys they're bringing in. Yeah, exactly. Nope. That's, that's very true. You, yeah. You think, um, if you are recruiting it for like a very specific type and you lose out consistently on that particular type, whether it's like, you know, an option quarterback, then you may have to start going for the pass oriented offense or otherwise you're going to have to just settle for the backups of, you know, for the, uh, for the type of player that your rival is basically now just like, you know, scooping right out under, uh, you know, from beneath your feet. So, yeah, that's a very good point. I mean, I think it's interesting. You can have like sometimes rivalries where teams are a little bit further apart and they don't compete for the same recruits exactly. And their, their pools are a little bit, uh, a little bit more segregated from each other. Those where you can actually well, kind of see like, you know, passing team versus passing team, you know, a little bit more consistently. Well, and, and I'd also throw, you know, kind of look in this, you know, I think similar type of mindset, like when we saw, you know, the Notre Dame Miami rivalry of the nineties or oh, the eighties. Yeah. yeah. Like and you perfect. talk about yeah. totally different. The optics were different. The styles were different. The co- how the, you sure. look at Jimmy Johnson versus Lou Holtz mm-hmm. and you look at the quarterbacks, the Tony Rice versus, you know, Steve Erickson, or, Steve Erickson, or, right. Or, um, 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 uh, Walsh, Walsh you know, yeah, yeah. you know, or, you know, even going back to Testaverde with, you know, Toretta, even, yeah, all those, yeah, guys. yeah, all those guys. And, you know, just the raw athleticism of Miami, as it was called. And then the mm-hmm. tradition of the golden dome and the leprechaun. And it was all this sort of, all of that, you know, you had two polar opposites, and they're getting the fist fights in the in the tunnel. You talk about great yeah. television. Oh yeah, exactly. I think that rivalry drives, and this is what makes this again really essential to to understanding why these matter. NBC gets Notre Dame, I think, in no small part because Notre Dame brings in four. We had at that point four or five rivalries that were events. Yeah, and like that was the marquee. Co- they're an independent program that everyone just got up to play yeah. and they got and fired up to play. Exactly. And they're, and they were segmented throughout the season. Like the Michigan game was usually in September. First, yeah. Um, yeah. The USC game was, if it was at Notre Dame was in year. October or if it's at USC it was like, you know, November. November. And yeah. And so, yeah, you'd have them all kind of spread out. So it's like perfect almost when you think about it from a, a broadcasting standpoint, it's like, oh well, this is ideal. We've got like four or five ready-made, high, you know, high viewership games just set, you know, in the schedule every single year. And, and it's why you see again where ESPN places the you know Duke UNC game at nine o'clock. Yeah. You know, there's never gonna be the seven o'clock game. That's the nine o'clock on a what usually Thursday or weekend. Yeah. And the whole because they know the country's gonna tune in because the the visuals alone between these two programs. Yeah. Are enough to drive people, and so there, there's those those they're they're opposite of style, opposite in substance, opposite in in optics. It's op- opposite in culture. That you know these rivalries sometimes, and even if it's not there, it can be manufactured to feel like it's there because it really culturally is there a major difference between Duke and Carolina. Yeah, I mean. They if if you go down there, they will say that it's, they will say it, and they and yeah. I and, and and they would say the same thing about us. Like, why are you really different than Purdue? Yeah, we we are and we aren't. I yeah. think we have better restaurants. Yeah, <laughs> and we'll, different different and, different students, different uh, uh, yeah areas yeah. of focus. I mean, although I mean, we got yeah. we got yeah, but I mean, we both have we both have a business school. You know, we yeah. both train teachers. Yeah. They have more engineers. We have more um, doctors. Oh, Doctors, yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Boy, that took me a minute. No, yeah, because yeah, I, because like, like I was gonna pass organic chem. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I'm gonna go. So when we come back from our next break here, we're gonna talk a little bit about we just we're 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 we are we are we are we are we are kind of jumping into that Purdue conversation. We're gonna talk all about Finally. our yeah. feelings about Purdue a little bit, our feelings about Kentucky, as well as why we think it's healthy for us. So.
when we come back after the break on the Back Home Network. Thanks. All right, Mike. Brass tacks. Do you really hate Purdue? <laughs> Good do question, you hate, Do you <laughs> loathe Purdue? <laughs> um, maybe uh, when, when I see... Um, as soon as I see Edie getting the ball in the post and we, we've got a bad angle on him, maybe in that like 0.3 seconds between the time he catches the ball and he's like dunking on Malik Renew's head, then maybe a little bit, but you yeah, know, I, 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 I don't have maybe as much enmity towards Purdue as the average fan. So um, should, should I explain, should I explain why? Yeah, go for it, because I'm going to throw in my my thing here in a yeah. second, but go ahead on that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, this is an open forum on, on this this segment. So, um, yeah, yeah. So, um, so yeah, I would say back in my childhood, I was not that much different than just the average fan in terms of the sense of rivalries. I was probably maybe not like a intense um, Purdue hater compared to like a lot of my other IU brethren. But, you know, I, I would say that definitely I wanted to beat Purdue pretty badly and uh, didn't have necessarily the best view of them overall. I, I would say that that changed a little bit. I, I have a story behind maybe the origin story of how that, that shifted. Um, so if you go back in like the early 2000s in my career, I was I just moved to Philadelphia and I was a training and recruiting coordinator manager at a, um, at a products company uh, here in Philadelphia. And every few weeks, we'd bring in new hires from different parts of the country to do like a week-long orientation. So this one week, I had all new hires from the southeast region of the United States. And, and it was, again, it was a week-long training. Uh, typically, the last night before everyone flew back home, I'd take them out to Maggiano's Restaurant in downtown Philly for a big, you know, family-style meal. We've been there. I yes. think, no. Yeah. I think, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, we, we grabbed some food there. Once. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So in this particular dinner, this one night with all of these um, new hires from the Southeast, uh, there were fans from five separate SEC schools. Um, I believe it was Auburn, Alabama, Kentucky, Ole Miss, and LSU. And because it was the last night and they had, uh, they had drank a decent volume of liquid encouragement during the dinner. Um, they all began to engage in a verbal argument over each school's history of cheating against their <laughs> own team. All, and not only that, all the while... Badge of honor. Exactly. All the while, fully acknowledging their own teams <laughs> were cheating at the same time, but fully convinced that the you know other... The yeah, the other school's cheating was somehow categorically different and just morally indefensible. And I don't know. I mean, as you as you can probably tell, like as a Midwestern boy, I just found this absolutely hilarious. It was like <laughs> I I never seen that before. It was thematically, it was almost like like watching the five New York crime families argue over <laughs> which ones had murdered. Um, more than more the, labor yeah. officials than the others. <laughs> it's like, we well, know we, we got we know where our bodies are, exactly. but yours. <laughs> yeah, we in the Gambino family were murdered three reps this year, but the Lucchese family has killed seven, and that's seven. just indefensible. <laughs> and so, yeah, and so except yeah, all that conversation except it's like about football and done within an accent range between you know, Stonewall Jackson and Foghorn Leghorn. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, yeah. So during this Dixieland Gomorrah, um, I remember thinking after leaving that dinner, like morally, how can you have that much antagonism against a school like Purdue, who objectively tries to do things the yeah. right way, when you know that there are far worse actors in the sport, like the ones you just saw at that dinner table, mm -hmm. and and since that, so I remember like since that evening i have a bit of a let's say a complex view of purdue it's not you know i i i think that it's obvious that there are good qualities about purdue um matt painter is a great guy uh, gene katie is a good guy they do try to do things right um i have different 
critiques of them, but I, I would say that absolutely that experience did change my perspective on how I look at it. So, so that's my story. Now, what's well, what's your I, view? <laughs> you know, when you, when you grew up in Columbus, Indiana, in a, in a town full of engineers, you have a few Purdue people. Sure. A lot of UL people, I might add, too. That, yeah. That's it, it, we get them from all over. But I, this is always a fairly healthy, and there's always been kind of a fairly healthy sort of. We're we're again, we're Midwesterners. We're nice to each other. Yeah. So especially Hoosiers, we're nice to each other, and that's the you know. Whether you're, you know, Purdue, IU, wherever, you have that 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 sort of relationship because you got to live with these people after it's all over, and you don't have the anonymity that you have in other places. Yeah. That being said, you know that rivalry between IU and Purdue in the '90s or the '80s, it was always you know the world shuts down. '90s world shuts down. It's like we beat them, we got them, and there was a lot of swapping home and home. Like we yeah. go to West Lafayette, we get beat. They go to they go to Bloomington, they get beat. And so everyone yeah. kind of saved enough face and you just kind of expected to go one and one and that was the end of it. No Big Ten tournament that day either. So True. it was there was no rubber match at the end, unless it was nineteen eighty, and that's that's why Mike Woodson, I think, still really just really wanted to beat Purdue mm. a lot. Yeah. Just they ended his college career. So I remember though going to an IU game, uh, IU Purdue game. It was my first. It was my junior no it was my junior year and we're there with you know our, our friend that we talked about earlier and a couple other dudes uh, we had tickets with and purdue beats iu at assembly hall in 1996 okay such like uh that austin. was that was austin's first okay and i remember seeing this little 511 guy I think he's 5'11", Todd Foster stomping <laughs> on the IU eye, just yeah. giving it just, and the ball, they, somebody either kicked the ball or fired the ball, hits the scoreboard. Yeah. I mean, they're just obnoxious. And I'm going, what? Where does this come from? I mean, we don't really like yeah. you, but this is a hatred. And so it's like almost yeah. visceral. Yeah, And you almost kind of like, when did this when did all this kind of kind of happen and yeah. you know in, from their perspective and i think it was you who told me well todd foster wanted to go to indiana oh yeah. <laughs> but fast forward if you know many years later i meet my wife she's she grew up in you know the rensselaer area oh, actually yeah, in from, rensselaer yeah, yeah parents are you know met at grad school in purdue mm. and she talks about when she was at rensselaer high school in the mid 90s or maybe it was middle school you know because she's a couple years younger than me I think it was high school. She was, she, you know, the Sunshine Club had this, that would break, brought in this Purdue basketball player. He's just the nicest guy on the face of the earth. It was Todd Foster. <laughs> yeah. I went, we yeah, were a few months into the relationship. relationship. Yeah. We were a few months into the relationship, and you just have that thought of, do you know that, do you know, what, oh, nice guy. Let me tell you what, let me tell you about this. The so and so. Let me tell you what this on, SOB did. Let's go on Galen Clavio's uh, account and show you what he did at the end of the game. <laughs> yeah, I will show you. And it's like, and you know how? I mean, I wanted, I wanted to physically maim the guy. Okay, yeah. so yeah. yeah, you wanted. Oh, he was so dreamy. Brian Cardinal was so. You, know, you love Brian Cardinal and Brad Miller. And you went to a couple of Purdue games and saw him play. And yeah. and at that point, like that, that. But at the same time, I mean. I, I I always try. I always jokingly say that I always keep at least one assistant with a Purdue backing, oh. um, or another pro. You know, basically, I don't want a bunch of IU guys. Meaning, I want someone who's going to see this a little differently. Yeah. But more than because I know that we're going to see some things differently. And you know, whether it was Jay Payne or Mo Mo Humphrey, who are both big Purdue fans, Jay mm -hmm. went there. Or, you know, going over the years of guys that I've coached with that, you know, Bill Porter, who coached with me for a few years, he was a Purdue guy yeah. uh, out of Lebanon of all places. So he knows a thing or two about that, that area and the game. Yeah. But, you know, these were, these were really good, you know, it, it's always good to kind of have some balance. And so I think over the years, my hatred's been more or less just almost a benign annoyance. Yeah, that's probably a good way to put it, I guess. Yeah. And my benign annoyance with Purdue really stems more from just the fact that and it's most of their fans are just phenomenal. They're great. We Oh yeah. I, I remember I was at a two thousand two bucket game. The two thousand no, I'm sorry, the ninety nine bucket game. We we had food and drinks and the Purdue fraternity ran out of beverages, so we, you know, entertained them oh, as them finish up. That, yeah. 
finished off the keg, you know, that sort of thing. And we just had a great time, you know, just sitting out there in the middle, you know, in our 20s, just enjoying each other's company. I threw beers down two years before that when they were, you know, some people parked in my parking lot. It's like, yeah, here, have a beer. You know what? We're Because even then, it's like you're not really all that, you know, the the hatred really isn't towards their fan base. It's really towards... You know the rivalry itself. It's more of a, a self. Yeah, it's more the thing. situation. Yeah, the situation yeah. than it is anything yeah. else. But you yeah, wanted my... to feel welcome when they were in Bloomington. Oh yeah, absolutely. I go to Ross. I go to Ross Aid Stadium wearing something like this, and I get hit with a Coke. I'm not. Yeah. I'm not kidding. Twenty years ago, I was yeah. there for an IU. I was there for a Purdue Michigan game wearing because it's like it's warm, and I I want to show my support for the, the Indiana school because I don't really want Michigan to win. And yeah. about the third quarter, I feel plop, and it's like, hey. Yeah. You know, we don't do this to you guys. If we do this to you, I want to know about it. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's, it's that annoyance. Yeah, it's it's interesting, I think. And I, I would say that's a good way to put it. Like, um, I, I kind of agree with you. Like, it, my experience is also the same. Um, I would say that, like, 90% of the pe- Purdue people I know um, are, like, objectively right. cool. They're objectively cool. Like, I, friends. I, would, I would say, like, Purdue people, I would actually put above, like, Michigan people and others. Like, mm-hmm. you know, even, like, I would say, like, Purdue folks generally are probably, like, towards the top of who I would want to hang out with. If there's a big bar and all Big Ten people around, I would probably have a lot more fun hanging out with the Purdue people just generally. Well, and, and I, can, I can tell you institutionally that's the case. Yeah. You know, the Commonwealth, you know, of... Uh, uh, the the common I would say the the committee for institutional collaboration yeah which was the academic Big Ten mm-hmm. doesn't happen if IU and Purdue aren't working together yeah um our student remember our student governments we work together all the time you know yeah. we knew it's like because we also knew there was a power to saying we were together on something especially when the state budget came along sure or we were a voting block in the association of Big Ten students I mean nobody really cares about this but it's just to kind of show that my favorite example though is COVID where IU basically turned all the public relations over to Mitch Daniels because they figured yeah. that they could that and the institutions worked so closely together on yeah. response both for on campus as well as some of their, their research and service initiatives. Yeah. It's well coordinated. Yeah. So at the end so of the a, day, yeah, rivalry in sports but collaboration elsewhere. It's like the ar- it's like the army and the navy. If yeah. the if if the if the barbarians are at the gate, you bet that the navy is going to be shelling to support army positions that's exactly. how this works yeah and yeah. that's 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 where this gets to you know and i think it's true you know across the board but i really think in this case it kind of jumps out at me as like there's there's it runs a lot deeper than just your football team is better than my football team yeah yeah team. that's true and yeah like i said i really love a lot of the things that purdue does like institutionally um mm-hmm. i'm from a family that you know likes aviation and so everything that has to do with uh um neil armstrong and um and basically what purdue as yeah gus grissom and uh amelia Earhart was a professor there so yeah that stuff is great i'd say that to be fair like you know the part of the purdue that i guess i would say is the annoyance part um to to expose the other side of the coin here um I guess, you know, at the fan side, like my biggest rivalry with any Purdue people are like a tiny, tiny sliver of the Purdue fan base. It's like those annoying prestige deprived trolls who <laughs> always seem to contact me when Purdue has won something. Yeah. And I mean, I remember it was years ago, like I was Purdue would, had beaten IU in some game um, and it kind of clobbered them out of nowhere. There's this guy that I had not spoken to in like 15, 20 years, just like instant messages me out of nowhere. It's like, you know, hey, we kicked your ass. And I didn't even remember that he went to Purdue. It was like, oh, oh, yeah, there's that guy from school. Oh, I guess he's a Purdue guy because, you know, he's yeah. wasted. And I can see Harry's, you know, in the background. So, um, yeah. So it was just odd just thinking like, wow, you know, you must have been carrying around a lot of baggage to pull this out like 15, 20 years later, just to shoot out a, a message, you know, out of right field like that. Like, I, I've never thought to myself after a big IU win over Purdue, it's like, hey, why do I rifle through the old junior high yearbook and see who I can randomly bugger and smack talk at 11 p.m. on a Tuesday night? 
because I know when they, you know, when we were you know uh, playing football in the eighth grade, this guy came to practice in a Purdue jersey. Yeah, yeah. yeah as his practice jersey. Yeah, I know exactly. that guy. Yeah, uh, yeah. The, the, go ahead. It, it, but again, we kind of go back. I mean, Purdue's kind of that traditional one. But I mean, for us and another, our bigger, our other big traditional rivalry, one that we've been to that game with ourselves on several occasions when we used to have it at, especially at the old Hoosier Dome, and it will always be the Hoosier Dome. Yeah. Um, Kentucky, when you really think about that second rivalry, mm-hmm. and over the years, I think we were both sitting together during the infamous black j- football jersey game of 1997. Oh yeah. Where Tim Couch came in and just obliterated, you know, the Hoosiers, and I think, and I mean, I think, I think it's actually safer for for many of us to be more, not just more, just visceral towards the University of Kentucky than Purdue. Yeah, I, I don't know why. I think part of it is, you know, they're they're not in the state. Yeah, border and the state. other thing is, well, there's also the whole Southeastern Conference thing. You know, yeah. and the, and, like we're and, talking and, about the dinner <laughs> pre pre NIL days. Yeah. Well, we knew they had bags. You know, oh, we yeah. know that they're buying their players. Jamal Mashburn just doesn't come down to the Duck City of Kentucky just because he likes them because he because he wants to see a horse up close. Oh, absolutely. Or, well, I mean, yeah. all that. Yeah, I mean, at the at that dinner I was describing earlier, there was a UK person at the table, and it took like every bit of my. <laughs> HR sense of professionalism, not to veer into some Chris Mills Emory Worldwide diatribe. Like, you know where that money came from. <laughs> you know where it was. Yeah, and, and I mean there were there were also I mean there are times where it's like you know they can't you know where we've gone down and approached some of their guys, but they've been more like to go, like grabbing a kid like a Kyle Macy out of the state or the Sean Kemp yeah. situation. Yeah, and and there was always this sort of feeling of crookedness and corruption um, that always just kind of just. And there was always like one kid that you grew up with that was a Kentucky fan. And I've got a friend of mine, Bennett, you know, JB, yeah. you know, he talks all the time, you know, like he's, he's still a big UK fan. And, you know, my first meeting I actually argued and I was wrong on the sports argument in a sports, in a bar. Mm. I actually went across and got a, got my IU night book and I had to go show that I was wrong to him. Cause I thought I was right. Cause I thought, I believe we won the 92, 93 matchup. I was wrong. We did not against the university of Kentucky. Yeah. The, the one in- that, that, the one in uh, Freedom Hall. Freedom Hall. Yeah, yeah. The next year at the Dome was the one I was thinking of. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, first meeting with this guy, and I mean, he's been reminding me of this for twenty five years. <laughs> so it's <laughs> yeah. it's like you know, and and but I think that there is when we talk about stylistic differences between the programs. Yeah, there is a difference. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I, I always say like the the distinction between Purdue and IU or Purdue and Kentucky and the rival and how I view them. Like one is kind of, like you said, like a moral one with Kentucky. Now, of course, you know, I've Kentucky friends too, and they, 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 they have their own uh, defense attorney um, retort to, you know, some of the bullet points I put out there. So I'm just giving my perspective. Obviously there's a counter to that. Uh, Purdue is definitely more like, like I said, like a stylistic one. It's, um, it's not, yeah, it's weird. Like thinking back, my beef with Purdue is, you know, they often don't help the Big Ten's problem with the, you know, the brutish Greco-Roman style of basketball right. that, you know, plagues the league, especially in March. Right. G- going back, my, my first recollection of seeing a basketball player with wrist tape and elbow pads was watching Purdue like in the early 80s on TTV4. You know, you think of Rowinski, Scheffler, Riley Cardinal. I mean, they always seem to have that guy somewhere on the team that was just like you know, <laughs> wrecking ball, throwing elbows, you know, in the lane. And <laughs> you, you, you actually asked for a really interesting thing recently. I don't know what you're going to do with it of the Scheffler flop at the end of an IU Purdue game in '89. Yeah, that's uh, yeah. I haven't decided well, what that gift, was, but that's gift worthy. Yeah, um, that was not. Yeah, Tony, I, I, Tony was nice. Tony Drani was nice enough to uh, to basically. Clip it, and uh, Jared um, Morris was. I th- Jared actually posted, I think, on X. Just <laughs> <That's> awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I remember watching that live. I'm like, oh my god, did he have a neurological episode yeah. that caused no, a, he was, a two he was, a two hundred eighty flopping for a foul? Yeah, it was. It was. Yeah, Who does that? Especially Scheffler. I mean, he was yeah. the u- ultimate kind of cry bully idea of like, yeah, he's gonna just play play wrestler for thirty nine minutes, and then you know at the end. <laughs> 
<laughs> be, to yeah. take a dive. So, yeah, it, it was funny. Like, the first time I remember seeing, like, that gear on a Purdue player, I, I had that same reaction, like that scene the Blues Brothers when they, they see the stage at Bob's Country Bunker <laughs> and the chicken wire. I, I remember seeing, like, elbow pads. Like, fellas, you know, are you sure in the right place? Like, the wrestling gym is, I think, two doors down the hall. And and the funny thing is, it's not always like that. It's like, mm-hmm. Purdue, like that's the that's the stereotype. There are many times where Purdue's had teams that I really like. I mean, I love the Baby Boilers in terms of stylistically. Like Jawan Johnson is like the perfect kind of big I would like to see more of in the Big Ten. Athletic, six ten, can hit shots from anywhere. You know, very modern in, in that sense. And then they replaced him with AJ Hammonds. And it was like at one eighty turn of the wheel back towards like the plow horse basketball style. I was like, no, no, wrong way, turn that way. <laughs> but it's also, but there is that that, and and it's interesting. And I kind of you know before we kind of wrap up this one here soon, as I look at this sort of you know Purdue, the the culture there is workhorse, mm-hmm. and so I never really see them as actually going into this sort of. I UK sort of, you know, UK 90 sort of approach or even UK yeah. this year, it's going to be, I think a lot of this, it's going to kind of, you know, harken back to Piggy Lambert running 1930s offenses. And yeah. John, we're, we're the institution with John Wooden, you know, yeah. he graduated from here. And so it's in so many ways it is. So I, I, I just, I kind of see it almost as a revert to revert to form. Kind of like I'll never see Wisconsin. I don't think we're ever going to see Wisconsin run, uh, you know, you know, run an empty ball side, you know, or and havoc defense. Yeah, you never. Think, you just it just feels weird to think yeah. of that being a possibility. And I think yeah, from but, us as fans of the game, you're like, how the hell are they still winning? Yeah. How is exactly. it? It the bottom's got to drop out of this thing. Yeah. How we, can we, you, we we could do a pod on Wisconsin someday. We'll, we that, we, we could actually will do, that do it for two we hours. Will, we and we one. will do Wisconsin someday because I know that that's but Wisconsin is pretty much a battle cry that you've heard for twenty plus years. And yeah. but but it's but it's also but Purdue and tackle basketball. Yeah. And I mean at the same you know and 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 really it's like at this point even Kentucky this year is a little different but in the last few years Kentucky hasn't been the same Kentucky. Sure. You know. They haven't been the same type of program, and and you hear that in their fan base because you know, and and at this point, you know, what's helping? I think one thing that's helping Calipari, Indiana's not exactly you know cutting down nets these days. Yeah. Louisville is a, I mean, a dumpster, wreck. a yeah. dumpster. It's it's a train, a train wreck, wreck going into a dumpster into fire. a dumpster fire with the Hindenburg crashing the into it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and there's got to be an atomic explosion someplace. Exactly. I mean, they're, going into uh, Chernobyl reactor four. All reactor the four. Yeah. Right. And I mean, so and and but at the same time, the rest of the Southeastern Conference is kind of caught up to a certain level, and so mm-hmm. you know, it's it's one of the you know again, I think, I think you know probably top two basketball conferences. You know, actually, maybe three when you throw the Big East into play, you can debate those three. I don't yeah. put the Big Ten in the top three at this point, just because I don't, I don't think it's there. But yeah. Kentucky, I think, you know, but it, you know, they're they're all, you know, at this point, I think that you know, it's 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 just a different this these rival the, the the IU rivalries are at such a place right now where it's going to be interesting in the next five years to see how all this shakes out. Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah, it's going to be interesting, and and ultimately. Is it healthy for us to have these? One hundred percent. Imagine, imagine sports without them. No, I can't. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I'll, I'll say this much from a coaching standpoint: even though little elementary schools here, you know, not, they're not all that little, but you know, with kids, you go through a grind of a twelve-game season where you're playing everybody. Yeah. And there's some games that you know, okay, this is Southside for Parkside. This is our rivalry game, and mm-hmm. it's really important. You know yeah. that we that we we are on our A game for this one. Yeah, we always have to be on our A game, mm-hmm. but the emotional stakes rise here, yeah. and and we 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 kind of it's it's a thing where you know again and, and you, we both grew up in two high school towns, northeast or north south in Terre Haute. Mm-hmm. There is 
you never know what's going to happen in those games particularly because sure. the emotional factor these are kids you grew up with these are kids you play on travel ball teams with now these are kids that you know you know you you may date their sister <laughs> you know yeah, it's exactly that they sort could be, of they thing could be is, family down the road they could be family down the road and you're going to and you want thanksgiving you need thanksgiving you want to have those bragging rights you may never use them but you want to make sure you have them in your hip pocket sure. yeah and it is healthy for us because i think it does kind of allow us some a level of, 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 of socially acceptable tribalism. Exactly. I always call it low consequence. Low consequence tribalism is much better than the, the high consequence we see in other parts of our society. Well, again, we, you know, it's not like we're fighting a war over any of this. Exactly. So, you know, yep. it's, it, that's, that's the plus of it. Yeah. So guys, uh, we're, we're at the end of this road. We want to say a big thank you to Bob Thompson for the music and, and soundtrack you hear on this show. And, uh, Special thanks to John Ringer of ringdesign.com for designing the logo and the artwork you see. And I'm going to, before I kick it over here, we're we're going to do things a little differently in episode six. We're actually going to put a third person on this for the, this one episode. I know, we're an not actual guest. <laughs> an actual guest. It's it's more like, you know, it's, I, I, instead of a guest, because I, I, I don't think you and I here, we're not like Tom Snyder, uh, uh, you know, doing... Yeah. Tom Snyder and Dick Cavett meet here, yeah, you know, because exactly. we are kind of the tomorrow show and the Dick Cavett show of the home of the, that, of the home true. field network. <laughs> yeah. You know, if somebody calls the tonight show, we, we just kind of, we, we jump in afterwards and kind of do our thing. Yeah. But, um, in coming days, we're going to, we're really excited to bring on somebody here, a good friend of ours who we've gotten to know over the years, who we think is debuting on the streaming internet. You know, we're not really sure yet. I don't, someone... I don't believe he's actually formally no. ever been on such no, a, a broadcast. I, I, I don't think so either. And, and, you know, he's uniquely situated and many of you will know who he is. If you don't know who he is, when we announce, you're going to want to get to know this guy. Exactly. He's, you know, he is, he, he's, and he's a top and, and an add on to a top notch dude. So, yep, exactly. Yep. So we will probably be, uh, and we'll be putting that out on social media at some point, and we will share uh, this individual's name at some point. But uh, check uh, the Twitters and on the home field, uh, sorry, the um, back home network uh, for uh, for that update. So we'll so get great. it out there. Yep, this was and a fun epi- episode. <laughs> yeah, it was. And real quick, that episode is going to be how programs evaluate who they bring in. A lively discussion about recruit and transfer scouting, player selection, and coaching hires. Great. Thanks, Bob. So this endless conversation was brought to you by the Back Home Network. Please check out all the great BHN content, including Assembly Call, Doing the Work, and Crimson Cast on YouTube and backhomenetwork.com. So until next time, I'm Mike Weemouth. And I'm Bob Motes. Have a good one, everyone. Take care. Hope you bought flowers today if you haven't. Exactly. (laughs) There's still 90 minutes left. You've got 90 minutes left. You can make this happen. (laughs) Goodbye, everyone.